Attention shoppers! Tonight on the checkout, Scott sheds too much UV light on sunscreen. The mechanics of private health insurance. And petrol prices make Craig... Snap! price of petrol. It's not just important, it's newsworthy. The highest petrol prices for almost three years. Drivers are being urged to fill up now. Petrol prices. Petrol prices. Petrol prices. Why is Canberra petrol so expensive? But despite all the attention, petrol margins are at historically high levels. Luckily the ACCC has special powers to ensure the petrol companies don't rip us off. Take it away ACCC man. The ACCC. No hang on. Hang on. The ACCC. No, hang on. This is going to be so good. The ACCC does not set petrol prices in Australia. They are determined by the market. Hmm? It is not against the law to simply price well above cost. <sighs> OK, so apparently it is legal for petrol companies to rip us off. But there are restrictions on how they rip us off. They can't just collude to set prices, for example. If they just look at each other's cards. Snap! <laughs> New laws in 2012 made it illegal for petrol companies to share their pump prices. But a company called Informed Sources collated the pump prices and the petrol companies bought that info from them. Info that wasn't made available to most consumers. Snap! <laughs> the ACCC said this was anti-competitive and took them to court. And we won. Yeah, sort of. They didn't stop the petrol companies getting access to this info, but from May 2016, this info, which is updated every 15 minutes, we made available to the public. So they can still collude, but we can watch them do it and play along. Snap. Actually, I should have said app, because that's one way you might get access to this information. So will this lead to a petrol app revolution that helps save you hundreds of dollars? Maybe. The problem is that this price information only covers half of the market. One of the biggest players, Coles, isn't even included. And neither are most of the independents, who often have the cheapest prices. So informed sources isn't that well informed. An alternative source of petrol price information that already exists are free crowdsourced apps. Prices are entered by ordinary people who for some reason are into that kind of thing. Hey, at least I'm not dressed like a wanker. We tried some crowdsourced apps and found a number of stations' prices hadn't been updated for some time. But plenty were up to date, and by just comparing stations in the same area, they pointed us to savings of more than 20 cents a litre. Which is how we saved enough money to get this cameo from half the Umbilical Brothers. There you go. Cheap half. So what effect will all this extra information have on the petrol market? To find out, I've come here to Western Australia. What is that? I said a swan like a Western Australian black swan, not a bloody Sydney swan. For years, WA's had Fuel Watch, which is a government-run scheme where petrol companies have to lock in their price for the next 24 hours and publish them. So Western Australians can get accurate price info for every petrol station every day on the Fuel Watch website, via email or on phone apps. You'd think that all this extra information would make petrol prices cheaper in Perth. But it doesn't. There is a way to get a good deal in Perth, though. Just use the weekly price cycle. Buy on Monday, don't buy on Tuesday. Simple. Using price cycles in other parts of the country is a lot harder. Other cities don't have predictable weekly cycles, but you can still look at them and figure out if it's heading towards its peak or its lowest point and purchase accordingly. I said we didn't need him. I'm just saying we'll fill up on the way home. You can find out your city's petrol price cycle by looking at the Petrol Spy app or at the ACCC's Petrol Cycle website, which also has useful tips like delay purchasing until later. OK, I will. That was for Melbourne. Oh, forget it. So if you want to beat the petrol barons, check the price cycle, use crowdsourced apps, and for May 2016, check informed sources too. That is not within the spirit of the game. But remember, don't drive too far to bag a saving. 83 cents? 
Honey, grab the kids. We're going to Melbourne. If you own Australia's most purchased car and drove just seven kilometres out of your way to save a cent a litre, you'd actually save nothing. So make sure your extra travel is worth the hassle. And if you do go to the trouble of saving yourself some bucks, remember where the petrol stations really rip you off. We've hit black gold! <laughs> They've got their Diet Coke delivery. Mm. Yup, it's all the convenience store items where the real markups are. Oh, I've got to tell people about these prices. Management is so important. Everything should be done at the optimal time. That's why we plan everything using the positive, doable solutions from our favourite trusted source of information, Good Health Magazine. Like when to exercise. And according to Good Health Magazine, the best time to exercise is between Early 2 in and the 6 day. p.m. Early in the day is best, uh, but between 2 and 6 p.m. is when your muscle strength peaks. What are you looking, looking at? at? I'm looking at Good Health magazine, February, March, issue 2016. Let me see that. Well, <laughs> that is ridiculous. I can't exercise at 2 p.m. Why not? According to Good Health magazine, I have to make an important decision at 2 p.m. Oh, well, what about 3 p.m.? Impossible. I have to take my asthma medication at 3 p.m. Oh, so after that at 4 then. Are you nuts? I have to have my last coffee at 4 p.m. Oh, fine. What about 5? OK, OK. I do have a little bit of a window for exercise at 5 p.m. in between all of the breathing, but that is beside the point because the best time to exercise is early in the day. You know what? This is ridiculous. Let's talk about it in the morning. Let's talk about it in the morning. Wake up! Hey, sorry about yesterday. Shh, I'm meditating, but it's time to make love. I have to start the day with meditation? Well, we need to have sex at 6am, so we're at an impasse. Zoe, you're asking too much of me. You know I have to have an operation at 9am. What? Good health says. Well, what kind of an operation? Who cares? It's the perfect time. Well, don't you forget to send an important email on the way in. Oh, God, I can't be thinking about that right now. Oh, don't worry. Good Health says that between 3pm and 4pm is also a good time. If car insurance was like health insurance, <laughs> and will you be wanting private car insurance? Why would I? For peace of mind. And because the government charges you a Medicare levy surcharge if you don't. What's the surcharge? 1% if you own over $90,000, 1.25% if you own over $105,000, or 1.5%. Uh, okay, okay, if they're going to tax me anyway, I'll, I'll just get the, the basic package. Oh, excellent choice. Uh, so that'll cover me if anything goes wrong with my car? Anything? <laughs> no, it's very, very basic. It's actually mainly to avoid the surcharge, but you can pay extra for more cover. So, when you crash your car, will you be damaging the lights, the engine, the wheels or the exhaust? How would I know? I don't know what I'm going to damage in the future. Well, different policies cover different things, so let's try to figure it out, yeah? Uh, is there a history of engine damage in your family? I don't know. OK, and I am going to need to know if there's going to be a baby in the car. We are considering having kids. OK, that is no problem at all. You just need to tell me 12 months before the baby comes. 12 months? My wife's not an elephant. I'm sorry, we do need to know a year out. Fine, I'll give you a call when I'm considering foreplay. OK, good. And is your car going to develop gasket problems or electrical faults? I don't know. Can't I just get everything covered? The comprehensive policy, wonderful choice. That means you get your choice of mechanic, you get the best spare parts money can buy, and all of that for just $500 a month. Oh, at least you've got private car insurance. I get my own choice of mechanic, right? You can choose any mechanic available today. Okay, who are they? Me. At least I don't have to pay for it. Mate, your private car insurance is only going to cover about two grand of this. You've got to cover the ten grand gap yourself. I wonder if he's got private health insurance. If car insurance was like health insurance. 
Back in 2014, we thought Australia's country of origin food labelling laws were an absolute Barry Crocker of a system. But tonight, we've got some good news. I'm listening. Oh, God, you're here. <laughs> I'm always here. Yeah, so anyway, uh, Christopher Pine has done something about it. I fixed it. Sort of. What do you mean, sort of? Well, the government has introduced new rules to simplify country of origin food labelling. Now, there are two things to look out for. One is a kangaroo logo. Is the other a koala? No, it's a bar chart. The kangaroo means the product was made or grown in Australia, but just because something is made in Australia doesn't mean the ingredients are Australian. That's where the bar chart comes in. It tells you what percentage of the ingredients is Australian. Now, under the old system, one of the big problems was product labelled Made in Australia from local and imported ingredients. Unlike Made in Australia, these ones don't have to be substantially transformed down under or spend 50% of their production costs here. Which is why these bird's eye barramundi fish fillets, otherwise known as Asian sea bass from Vietnam covered in Australian breadcrumbs, can use it. Yeah, that was bullshit. Well, you shouldn't see any of that sort of nonsense anymore. Under the new rules, products that have just been packed in Australia or only had simple processing here must use this label. They can't use the kangaroo symbol. Great! But they can use the bar chart to tell you the percentage of Australian ingredients as well as putting it into words. Nice. Now, what if the whole bloody thing is a foreigner? If food is imported, the label has to tell you which country it's from. So there you have it. A kangaroo logo means the product's made or grown in Australia, and the bar chart shows you what percentage of the ingredients is Australian. Wait a minute. Under this new system, how can I tell where the non-Australian ingredients come from? They don't have to say. Oh, mate. Some might choose to, but even Barnaby Joyce accepts that stating the origin of every ingredient is impractical. How far back are we going to follow a, a, a can of tomatoes from overseas? If it went from Italy to China and from South America? Because sometimes we find that these products have multiple, have multiple venues which they came from. And we all know how he feels about undeclared imports. Same way I do. You're kind of xenophobic, you know? Please explain. Well, it's not a bad thing that we can buy stuff from other countries and they can buy stuff from us. Australia! Never mind. Just remember, these new rules start on July 1st, 2016, but they'll take a while to be phased in. In the meantime, if you see the words growing in Australia or product of Australia but no kangaroo symbol, don't worry. It's still 100% Aussie. Good. Now, what can you tell me about halal? Ah, we're out of time. <laughs> In the consumer justice system, the people are protected by the ACCC and their elite scam prevention unit, the ACCC, C, 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 C. These are their stories. Well, it has been running slowly, yes. Uh, Chief, some of the uh, squad are going to O'Reilly's for a drink. You want to come? Oh, give me a minute. I'm just on the phone with the computer people. You call IT at 6pm? No, Microsoft called me some techno babble about a virus or some such. Damn it, Norton Lodge, that phone was one day away from retirement. Uh, let me guess, Chief. Did Microsoft call you up saying that your computer was sending them error messages? Uh, maybe that a virus was affecting the performance? Maybe? What of it? <laughs> Microsoft never make unsolicited phone calls! Never? Never. If you get a phone call out of the blue about a computer problem, just hang up! Maybe I am getting too old for this job. Too bad, Chief. This scam affected thousands of Australians last year, costing millions of dollars. Many of them over 55. Perhaps I will have that drink after all. Microsoft calling me. I'm on and on. It's not just Microsoft, Chief. These scammers will pretend to be Telstra, the NBN, anything to sound legit. Yeah, sometimes they'll call you and say that they can sell you some software to fix the problem. Or they'll ask you for remote access through a website or something. Remote access? Yeah, it's where they ask to take control of your computer so they can fix the problem from the back end. But what they'll actually do is take your private information or sometimes install a virus. So they'll tell me there's a virus on my computer and then install a virus on my computer. Makes me sick! Same again? Sure. Cheap's getting soft. Uh, 
I think he's going to be more careful in the future. <laughs> you think he'll remember that legitimate businesses never call you out of the blue to talk about a computer problem? Yes, and I think the next time he is cold called by somebody asking for remote access, he'll know to hang up. Yeah, and what happens when someone asks for the old man's credit card? Look. I think he knows never to give that information to an unsolicited call. You know, I think the Chief's going to be okay. Uh, 6129 2991. Chief, no! Remember these videos that show you how to protect your skin from sun damage? So if I understand this ad correctly, all you need to protect yourself is some of this great black face paint, which I'll now apply on national television. Whoa, 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 whoa. what are you doing, mate? Stop it, stop it. Put that down right now. Look, that's not black face paint. That's sunscreen. <laughs> Ooh. Remember these videos which obviously show how sunscreen protects your skin from sun damage. Well, most of us know that a higher SPF means more protection and plus means extra and broad spectrum is good, I guess. But how come even if you buy the highest protection stuff with the four hours water resistant and the broad spectrum, you still need to reapply all the time, especially if you're swimming? And how come some sunscreens say four hours water resistant on the front, but when you turn them around, it says you have to reapply every one to two hours. I mean, we wouldn't accept that from any other product. So how long will this last for? You'll be good for four hours. Sunscreens tested in labs using volunteers who agree to be sunburned. Good on you, genius. Please don't insult the volunteers. SPF, or sun protection factor, means how much longer it takes to get burned with sunscreen than without. Of course, in the real world, people burn at different rates. So if you'd normally burn after 10 minutes without sunscreen, with SPF 30, it would be 30 times longer. With SPF 50, it's 50 times longer. That means I got to stay in the sun for 50 seconds. Wow! The plus means the SPF has to be at least 10 points higher again. So SPF 50 plus oddly means the SPF has to be at least 60. Happy at least 21st birthday! In Australia, SPF 50 plus is the highest protection level manufacturers are allowed to advertise. That's because higher levels don't really offer much more protection. But if you want the full protection, applying sunscreen properly can actually be more important than the number on the bottle. Firstly, you should use at least a full teaspoon for each limb, one each for the front and back torso, and half a teaspoon for the face, ears and neck. That is six and a half teaspoons. You didn't have to break. Which means all of this is only meant to last you three applications. Unfortunately, many of us only use one fifth to half this amount. And the bad news is, if you only use half the amount, you only get half the protection. A lot of bottles say four hours water resistant. What does this mean? Well, they lather up Einstein over here, let him dry for 15 minutes, and then they can claim four hours water resistance if the sunscreen still has an SPF factor of 30 or more after four hours immersion in water. But sweating, rubbing your skin, or drying it with a towel will all reduce sunscreen's effectiveness. So unless you go to the beach in perfect lab conditions, it's unlikely you'll get the full four hours. But even if you do use sunscreen precisely as advised, you might not be getting the sun protection you think, because sunscreens can degrade over time, especially if kept in hot places like a car dashboard or glove box. So that means my sunscreen needs sunscreen? Oh man! And consumer groups in Australia, America and the UK have also found that sunscreens don't always deliver their supposed SPFs. What? You promised to burn me with scientific rigour. Oh, great. Now I'm going to have to catch another backpacker. Wait, 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 wait. It's OK, it's OK. You, you, can, you can test it on me. So you should still use a high SPF sunscreen. Especially you. But store it in a cool, dry place, check the expiry date, and remember, how much you apply and how often you reapply can make all the difference to how much protection you get. So maybe that old sunscreen ad needs a bit of an update. We're all done here. Oh, great. That wasn't so bad.
Hello and welcome to F YouTube, the segment where the consumer is always right. Cheers. First up, it's Ingrid, who had an issue with Virgin Australia. Ingrid prefers to remain anonymous, so she'll be played by this talking neck pillow. I booked a return flight with Virgin Domestic but then I needed to change the date of the second flight. Ingrid saw online that for changes to saver flights, Virgin charges $80 plus the price difference of the new ticket. Luckily, for the date I wanted, the return flight was the same price. Being a conscientious neck pillow, she even confirmed this with Virgin on the phone. Yes, there's no additional charge because the new fare is the same. So Ingrid's a smart neck pillow too, because she didn't change her booking on the phone, which avoided Virgin's $35 guest contact centre fee for talking to a human being. Or a sock. But when I used the Virgin website to make the change, I was charged more than $80, because as well as changing the date of my return flight, the website also rebooked the first leg of my trip, even though it wasn't even changing, and the fare for that first leg had gone up. Ingrid was angry. Flights aren't like trousers. You should be able to change one leg without changing the other. Something I would expect a sock to understand. When Ingrid asked for a refund, Virgin said it was a problem with... Website functionality. But they did also... Sincerely apologise for any inconvenience. Great. And the refund? I am unable to refund the fair difference at this time. So, no refund at that time. But the time we asked Virgin, they said... We apologise and will provide a refund. Virgin says what happened to Ingrid was an error, and we agree. But is it an error that's built into the Virgin system? Yes. No! Get it together, brand sock! Ingrid's not the only one who's had an issue like this. Paul also booked return flights with Virgin. He's represented by a Virgin sick bag tonight because he didn't want to appear on the show. <laughs> I was perfectly happy to appear. Too late, Paul, sorry. Anyway, Paul here missed the first flight on his ticket. But when he turned up for the return flight... Virgin had cancelled my booking because they said flights have to be taken in the order they appear on the ticket. And indeed, that's what the Virgin Conditions of Carriage say. You must use flights in the sequence they appear on your ticket. And you must commence your journey with the first coupon. Yay! <laughs> Qantas says the same kind of thing. But that's not the impression the airline's booking systems give. Even when booking a return flight, as customers, we select the first flight from a range of different days, times and prices, and then the second. They look like two separate products that you just decide to buy in one transaction. Not a pair of purchases that are secretly Siamese twins. At least in Ingrid's case, Virgin admitted it was wrong, eventually. They say it was an isolated incident. But we'd like to know if other people have experienced isolated incidents like it. Because we think you should probably get a refund too. So send an email to tipoff at thecheckout.tv. In the meantime, we're conducting our own very thorough research too by sending Ingrid the neck pillow on an all expenses paid return trip to Fiji with Virgin. Oh. And I won't stop resting until we get to the bottom of this. Next up, it's Jocelyn. Hi, Jocelyn. Hi. Jocelyn bought some outdoor wicker furniture from Harvey Norman Warrawong. You know what? I'm just going to let Jocelyn do the talking. In total, the furniture cost us around six and a half thousand dollars. Six and a half grand? That's more than this bottle of coconut water. I think. Yeah. But that's apparently the price you pay at Harvey Norman for... Amazing garnered furniture. That's... Weatherproof. And... UV resistant. And... Offers UV protection for an amazing finishing touch to your outdoor area. But the only thing Jocelyn found amazing was that four years later... When you touch the wicker, it actually turned to powder or broke apart under your fingers. When you touch it, it's finished. <laughs> that is amazing. Under the consumer law, goods have to be of acceptable quality and that includes being reasonably durable. We think if you pay six and a half grand for a lot of outdoor furniture, it's reasonable to expect it to last longer than four years. But Harvey Norman said it's Jocelyn's problem cause... The furniture had been stored outside and was subjected to the elements. You're not meant to put your outdoor furniture outdoors. Goods have to be fit for any disclosed purpose. And the purpose of outdoor furniture is kind of disclosed by definition. But 
Like a good furniture mum, Jocelyn kept her outdoor furniture undercover. An awning wasn't good enough for Harvey Norman, though. She then said, yes, but it doesn't have sides. And I said, do you mean like a room? And she said, yes. When Jocelyn complained, Harvey Norman told Fair Trading... Although the goods are designed for outdoor use, general care should be taken to avoid direct exposure of the elements. And so, according to the Harvey Norman store... We do not owe you a remedy under the Australian Consumer Law. But we reckon under the Consumer Law, Jocelyn is now entitled to her money back. And not just... A partial a... refund as a gesture of goodwill. And as for Harvey Norman's argument that outdoor furniture should be kept in a room with four walls... That's not very durable either. Finally tonight, it's Joe. And it's not an F you, really. In fact, we just wanted to say thank you to Joe for his feedback by the checkout Facebook page about Kirsten's piece on hotel booking sites. Remember this one? You can always call the hotel directly before making a booking through an online comparison site. They can often get you a better deal. Well, that's exactly what Joe did for a hotel in Bali. We contacted the Hotel Direct and literally saved $800. Well done, Joe. The Bintang singlets and Southern Cross tattoos are on us. I just hope you don't have to change your flight with Virgin. Well, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Uh, sorry, Alex, but that's actually a misrepresentation. Next Thursday, in the checkout time slot, instead of a show about products that aren't fit for purpose, ABC will be showing opposition leader Bill Shorten for 30 minutes. And since it seems that the Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, will then seek a double dissolution, there's never been a better time for a Chaser election special. So tune in for the Chaser's Election Desk from Wednesday 8 June, and the checkout will be back, for a limited time only, after the election.